I want to thank you all for being here in person and virtually. Um, my name is Angela Anthony, and I am the communications director for Helms Bakery District. Uh, Helms Bakery, for those who don't know, is a historic landmark built in 1931 when it was an actual working bakery. Now we get to host events like this, really uh, interesting and culturally connecting conversations with partners like Zocalo. Um, we are now a creative hub, uh, furniture and design showrooms, specialty shops, restaurants, and then we curate a calendar of events, all art, architecture, and design focused. So um, it is the support of the Marx family who own the property, as well as the tenants who are here that allow us to do things like this evening. So if you're interested in additional events, please go to the website, sign up for the newsletter. I promise I will not spam your inbox. And um, I wanna thank you for being here. I'm gonna turn this over to Moira, who's going to introduce the panelists, and we will start the evening. Thank you, everyone. Hello everyone, welcome. My name is Moira Shuri, and I'm the executive director of Zocalo Public Square, a creative unit of Arizona State University. We are honored to be partnering with Helms Bakery District for this event tonight. We publish original journalism and we curate events just like this one. Today's event is titled, Can a New Generation of Leaders Shake Up LA's Culture? At Zocalo, our mission is to connect people to ideas and to one another. Everything we do is free and everyone is welcome. Find out more on our website, zocalopublicsquare.org. Both audiences here in person as well as online on our YouTube channel can submit questions and comments today. If you're watching online, please use our YouTube live chat uh, to participate. For everyone here at Helms, welcome. You can submit questions via text message uh, on the numbers printed on signs. At the check-in table, yes. Um, and please stay after tonight's panel for our reception, where you can meet each other and our panelists and enjoy a glass of wine hosted by Helms. Finally, you may have found a survey on your seat um, please help us out by filling out the survey because we want to get to know you um, and celebrate and uh, just be able to get to know you better. Moderating, today, moderating today's panel is Francis Anderton, a familiar face and voice to many of us. There isn't a part of LA's cultural landscape that Francis, a longtime radio journalist and producer, has not reported on and she wishes she could spend more time with her plants and animals. <laughs> Over to you, Francis. <laughs> Thank you very much, Moira. And I, when we say animals, I mean farm animals. Cows and sheep, that's the animals I love. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you, Moira. Thank you, Angela. Um, it's so great to see you all um, out in person. What, what a pleasure. Um, and I'm such a fan of Zocalo. I've worked in various ways with the folks at Zocalo for, for literally years, and they do wonderful work, and now I'm involved with Helms. It's just a real pleasure to be able to be collaborating with them in this way. Um, talking about a topic that is so, um, so, so very important and germane to now. I think that we were all very aware that there was cultural flux, there was change going on even before the pandemic and the George Floyd murder that has resulted in such a reckoning on so many levels. Um, and that change was happening very, very much so within cultural institutions. Um, the change has intensified over the last couple of years and um, those changes have included changes of leadership. You're going to meet these three leaders in a moment, leaders at the Max Center for Art and Architecture at Inner City Arts at the California African American Museum. And I will do proper introductions momentarily. But there's been some other big shakeups on the cultural scene in LA. Probably some of you have been reading about what's been going on at MOCA, where we have a new 
um, woman in charge, Johanna Burton, who's taken over as Klaus Biesenbach bows out. I just yesterday got an email saying that the Gamble House in Pasadena has appointed their new executive director, the, their first woman, Alexandra Rasik. Um, we've seen cultural venues close. We've seen some of them morph into mobile collectives in over the time of immense sort of stresses during this pandemic. And we've also seen passings, you know. We've, 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 we've said goodbye to at least one extraordinarily, I guess you could say, powerful arts philanthropist over the last year, Eli Brode. And you cannot talk about culture or culture production without talking about how it's funded. Um, and to that point, our directors that you're going to be hearing from who are all highly innovative, have got big visions for their institutions, they still have to, they have to, they have to get the funds. They have to answer perhaps to some of the same funders as over the past, face some of the same pressures as their, as their predecessors. They have to raise money, sell tickets, attract an audience, stay relevant. What does staying relevant mean now in the midst of all of this change? So there's a lot to talk about. It's a very, very exciting time. And let's go right into who you're going to hear all about it from. Starting immediately to my right, Cameron Shaw. She is executive director of the California African American Museum, which I'm sure you're all familiar with in Exposition Park. Prior to joining the staff of CALM, she ran a very interesting organization in New Orleans, Pelican Bomb. Hopefully, we'll hear about what that name means. Um, a non-profit contemporary art organization, a forum for exhibitions, public programming, programs, arts journalism. She's also widely published as a writer, editor in the New York Times, Art in America, LA Review of Books, Bomb Magazine, and that's just the start of her resume. So welcome, Cameron. Um, next to Cameron, Jia Igu, longtime friend of mine from the architecture world. She is now the director of the Max Center for Art and Architecture. That is the Experimental Center for Art and Architecture, which is headquartered at the Schindler House on Kings Road in West Hollywood. The seminal design by R.M. Schindler, if you haven't yet visited. Gia also co-directs the architecture research and design studio Spinagu with Maxi Spina. She's also a teacher at the California College of Art, and she previously ran another very interesting cultural institution called Materials and Applications. That's a project space for experimental architecture. Welcome, Gia. Um, and then to Gia's right, Shelby Williams-Gonzalez, president and CEO of Inner City Arts. I'm sure you're all familiar with Inner City Arts. I think it's been going about 30 years now. Correct. And someone from Inner City Arts here? Did I hear correct? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh, <laughs> Anyway, Inner City Arts, fantastic institution, provides arts classes for students in schools that are perhaps underserved, not perhaps, they are underserved in the arts within the LAUSD and charter schools and now going, I think, beyond. So, um, and Shelby has another life as a dancer and choreographer, which is so fantastic. And she is with the critically acclaimed Afro-Brazilian dance company, Viva Brazil. Um, she teaches dance and performing arts at LAUSD. She's developed programs for the California Dance Institute, a place called Home, and the LA Opera's education program, which is great because in opera, people didn't used to dance. So, yeah. well. <laughs> they used to stand on stage and sing, and you're making them dance. That's so great. So this is Shelby. And in fact, we have to add another feather in her cap, which is it was her idea to have this conversation because she was in <laughs> <laughs> so with because Shelby recently took on this new role and she's a friend of Zocalo and she sort of pointed out the fact there was a kind of a theme going on which was there's a lot of new leaders taking the fall probably it's fair to say many more women perhaps in the past people of color than in the past so with all of that let's throw it to you let's just start by hearing just a little bit, <laughs> and we're going to start with you, Shelby, because okay. it was your idea. In fact, tell us why you thought we should talk about this. Why should we be talking about this new cultural leadership? 
Well, I think because it's changing the landscape of Los Angeles, and that's really exciting. Not to take away or not to have sort of cultural amnesia, right? Change is cyclical, but this is a change that I'm a part of. Sorry, I hear there's a little feedback. Um, and I just, I wanted, I wanted to share that. So when I was talking with Moira about it, I was like, well, it's not just me. Like, there's a shift in the city. And I think if we talk about it, even our institutions can do things together in that time of change, right? Let's embrace it. But how does that shift take form? And I'm going to ask each of you the same question. Within your own institution, so you've come in, tell us about sort of who you have succeeded, who's your predecessor, and what do you see yourself as bringing to this institution that might sort of be that change? So I think at Inner City Arts, uh, something that is very unique to this change is one, yes, I, it's obvious I, I'm a woman. I identify as a woman that's new to the Inner City Arts. I'm also a woman of color, very new to Inner City Arts. Um, but aside from those, those hats that I wear, it's, I come from a place of being both a teaching artist and an artist myself. And I'm really bringing that lens into this work and kind of reconnecting our mission statement from that place. I think so often for such large institutions or an institution that can run on its legacy, you can get detached from who is at the heart and the heart of our organization. The reason we exist is to provide arts programming to young folks and to provide a space for artists to thrive as well. And I want to make sure that our space is doing both those things. So are you saying that previously it was not managed by artists and that gave rise to a different kind of management? I, I think it does, it, it changes the lens. It becomes a, how can we be a program provider, right? We're gonna provide, but I, I wanna change our space into that it's creative, not just for our young people, but for the, for the staff, the, everyone who's involved in the, on our campus. Right, now you identified this theme that there are more, there's a sudden change in, the, in leadership in a lot of institutions, but are you saying that that too is something that's occurring in more than one institution, that artists are coming to the fore as management and that's kind of shifting? Or are you seeing that just in your own I'm seeing that in mine. I don't know, you okay. guys can okay. talk about your changes. Okay, <laughs> so, so, so Gia, tell us, tell us about yourself and the, the, the Mac Center and um, what, what, what you, what you believe you're bringing to this institution that might set it on a different path? Yeah. Um, so I, I go at it in two ways. One is as an institution, and the other as an institution that works at the intersection of art and architecture. Can you hear me okay? You're a little quiet. Perhaps. A little quiet? Yeah. So on, on the one hand, I think about um, institutional practices very often and what it means to rethink the institutional practices we have in our organization so that we can actually think about the agency an institution has to, for example, redistribute resources, rethink the dynamics of power in an institution, and rethink avenues of decision making that impact all the work that we do. On the flip side is the fact that architecture is a very white field. It's a very white profession and there's a very small number of um, practicing architects who are persons of color. So I think a lot of my work right now as thinking about how to, in the very small, I'm not, I didn't go in trying to change the world, I went in trying to change the environment I was finding myself in. So I'm not claiming a radicalness of like the whole world's changing. Um, but I, I think a lot about um, what does it mean to be um, in, a field that has historically been a very challenging field for persons of color, whether for systemic reasons, whether for actually a huge part of systemic reasons. Um, and I, we can talk more about that. I don't know if. Well, we will in a moment. We'll, we'll talk about your, I guess, the people that run the Mac Center. We'll get to that in a, yeah. in a minute. Um, Cameron. Um, I was drawn to the California African American Museum CAM, um, first and foremost because of the mission, which is to research, collect, preserve, and interpret for public enrichment the art, history, and culture of African Americans with an emphasis on California and the Western United States. So CAM was founded in 1977. Our mission is as relevant today as it has ever been. Um, on a personal note, 
I had been developing and building a career over the last 20 years um, and had amassed a set of skills, experience, knowledge. Um, and I was seeking a way to use that, but also to deepen my sense of meaning and purpose in the world. Um, and so I see myself as joining a legacy at CAM, and that legacy is building dynamic and accessible space for all people to see black lives, experiences, and creativity valued and reflected. So there's a picture of our founders at the ribbon cutting in 1984, and I look at that picture a lot, um, and I see the charge in my role as, and with our staff to be as visionary in 2021 as they were in 1977 to think that there should be the first Museum of Art, History, and Culture devoted to African Americans that's also supported by a state. So we are a state-supported museum. Right, now that's interesting. So now you, you, are, you are honoring, in a way, the legacy mm -hmm. that was established, but do you also see yourself as wanting to take calm off in kind of new and unexpected directions that might almost not be a breach, but at least be, be, be different from what your predecessors were doing with the museum? I'm, deeply interested in the fact that CAM has been constantly reinventing itself over the years. So I see myself as part of also that legacy of imagination and reinvention. And yes, I think it will look different in 2021 than it has at different points in our history, but I don't see it as a break so much as I see it as a evolution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've mentioned that you're state funded. Um, so let's start, let's actually start there with, with, with just sort of who, who I guess sort of pays the piper. So um, The taxpayers of California. <laughs> right. In your case, it's the taxpayers of California. In Gia's case, it's the taxpayers of Austria, or up to a point, up to a point, and we'll get to that in a minute. But so, okay, so, so, so um, do you, as, as you think about kind of maintaining, but also building on the legacy of the past, you, 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 do you, do you, I guess, have a, have a client? Like, when you have the state funding like you do, are you in dialogue, in constant dialogue with the funding organization, or, and, and does that in any way sort of impact the way you think about it? Because you, because you said that all your predecessors, each one of them has been radical, each one of them has been building this organization, but are they doing it in concert with the sources of funding, or do you have kind of total independence? It's an interesting way of framing it because I don't think of either of those things of being the way it works. Um, we do have a complex system that we navigate, which is the bureaucracy, and that is the privilege that comes with being the steward of state funding. Um, so there are systems that we uphold and that we navigate. I am in conversation with members of state government at many levels on a regular basis. It's a big part of my week. Um, but I don't see that as something that holds us back. I actually see it as, like I said, a privilege. And that privilege has become abundantly clear to me in this past year, um, or this past two years now going on. Um, of what it means to have the stability that comes with right. state funding. It's also not lost on me that I'm a black woman arts worker with a pension. That's incredible. We also have many of the things that arts workers are advocating all around the country. We have unionization, we have collective bargaining, we have salary transparency. You know, these are things that are built into our system. We have budget transparency. So for me, I'm really thinking about what the opportunities are. But do I think there are other opportunities beyond state funding? Yes, absolutely. And um, as we look to the future and I think about the scale upon which I'd like to be enacting, the level of experimentation and freedom that I'd like to bring to our public programs, to our exhibition making, to our artist projects, I do see us moving towards a model that thinks about what monies do best, right? I think state monies protect people and uh, maintain facilities. 
in incredible ways that I'm very grateful for. I also think that private funding opens up new opportunities for artists and scholars to think in imaginative ways. And I'm very eager about thinking about what it means to model that public-private partnership as we move into the oh, next phase. Oh, that's interesting. In what, in what way? Because that, is that new for CALM, to bring in a, a, a sort of private-public? At different points in CAMP's history, there has been a foundation that helps support the organization. That foundation has been defunct for over five years, so my hope is to work with our board and our stakeholders to develop a new foundation that can help uh, help us think about that in the way that I mentioned, so thinking about what money does well and how we can use that as a platform for you know doing some big work that we have, which it might include a building remodel, a building expansion, a, wow, you know more ambitious and experimental projects, commissioning of artist work. These are all things that I see us doing in the future, and I think we're going to need a diversified model in order to accomplish those things effectively. You're really thinking of building a new building. I think we have a gorgeous building that was built in 1984, and there is a way that we need to bring our building into the future while honoring the black architects and the history of the building, yeah. Huh, so you might become a patron of architecture. I have always considered myself a student of architecture. I was raised by an architect. Uh, it's, part, it's part of, you know, I, I think about the ways that buildings help people learn and grow and understand what they're supposed to do in a space, right? And I think that that's something that we need to be thinking about. No, it's really interesting you bring this up because, be, and we're not gonna, unfortunately we can't spend too much time on that, but, but, it, but it is certainly true that a lot of cultural institutions have gotten involved with building new buildings. And sometimes that's a huge asset and sometimes it can create, let's just say, complexities for the organization. <laughs> So, but that's very interesting that you might be doing a new building. So, so, so I'm stepping back to, towards, towards you, Chelsea. So, so, so Gia, you're, the institution you're with now, MAC, the MAC Center for, for Architecture and Art, has a really interesting structure, I suppose you'd say. Can you just explain that structure? When I said, when I referenced Austria, what I mean is the um, Austrian Museum for Applied Arts and Crafts is a partial, what is yeah, that? So you explain. Factually, it. just to, I think there's an impression that we are um, somehow privately funded by the state of Austria, which is not true. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization, and like every nonprofit organization, we have to um, uh, fulfill a specific condition of public support for our organization. So we are partially supported in, um, primarily through um, um, the museum itself in Austria, and then the rest we have to raise ourselves as any nonprofit does. Um, I want to say our building's built in 1922, and it still <laughs> yeah. kind of works. <laughs> no, no, but, but, but 1922 <laughs> might be better than 1984. It's definitely better 1984 than 1984. Yeah. Was, was not a good year yeah. for architecture. <laughs> although, yeah. although I think we have to be careful these days with energy issues too, before we yeah. just toss we, aside buildings, but that's a for another conversation. Yeah. So carry on. So, 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 so my perspective of our funding model is that, and support model, is that there is um, an international body that fully believes in and invests in Los Angeles's art and architecture landscape and is willing to pull from their own exhibition funding to support what is happening in Los Angeles. And I think a large part of my work is to ensure that um, I advocate in Los Angeles to um, rise to the challenge that Los Angeles also sees the values um, of our institution and the history and values that we steward. Um, partially that is the history of experimental and um, let's say to an extent socialist architecture because I don't know if people know about the Schindler House, it was designed as a cooperative living for two families. Um, the, uh, it was designed by an Austrian architect, therefore the Austrians, um, and he was, the whole, the, whole, the whole enterprise was a socialist avant-garde experimental artist community. So a lot of our work is to make sure that um, there is this, um, this value system around collectivity, experimentation, and a kind of rethinking of living, um, whether that's in artistic practice or architectural, architectural work. Right, and it's also a wonderful destination. You can visit the Schindler House and see this 1922, 1922 just marvel of architectural experimentation in this gorgeous garden. But back to your um, 
to your Austrian sort of partial um, support system, um, to what extent are they interested in your goal that you were just referring to earlier, which is this other goal, really, which is literally changing the face of architecture, yeah. changing up the fact that it's been really very limited in terms yeah. of who gets to play in the sandbox and was for many decades. Are, are your folks, and by the way, we should say Gia was up at 1 a.m. doing a phone call with her team in Austria and is Brava for oh, it was doing a, No, no, it, was a, it, was a whole, it wasn't Austria. It was Zurich. Oh, yeah. Zurich. But Zurich. I was up till three, it so was, excuse me was, if I'm like <laughs> totally incoherent right now. It's nine hours. Wherever it was, it yeah. was nine hours and, and late, very late for an Angelino. But, but how, did the, how do your folks in, in Vienna feel about this part of your the yeah. mandate you've given yourself. I mean, we have a director in Vienna who's a call, um, you know, we work closely, and um, she's very interested in expanding the Eurocentric history of the institution in Vienna, and she's also the first woman director. So our value systems align completely. Um, I think that very similar to what I think Cameron's saying, the very term experimental means that every era or every moment or every opportunity, there's a moment for evaluation and reinterpretation because that is the idea that you're always advancing, critiquing, rethinking, and, and sort of innovating on what is a status quo. So in our mission is the premise that we need to be constantly rethinking and innovating as an institution, in the communities that we're building, in our, the social relationships that we have, in the dynamics, and I think the institution has always been very it's self experimental. I mean, you know, it, it was an institution in Los Angeles. Um, the previous director to myself, um, well, two directors previously, Kimberly Meyer, she was a student of Michael Asher, who, you know, is an artist of institutional critique. We were also one of the early institutions that were thinking about artistic practice beyond studio based, object based, gallery based work. We were really pushing artists to work contextually, site-specifically, relationally, situationally, and that has been sort of our history. So now we have a different mandate because as maybe you've noticed, many modern houses are having exhibitions in the modern house. So my question right now is what does it mean to be a contemporary institution in a modern house and what does it mean to be, what does it mean to rethink institutional practice beyond, um, you know, uh, the kinds of shows that we're showing. I think it's a relational question. What is the relationship the institution have to audiences and what is the um, value system that we hold to? Hmm, that's interesting. So you find yourself now, what, somewhat in competition with other institutions that are situated in modern houses? That's, a, that's an interesting I don't know if it's Yeah, I don't know if it's in competition, but eventually you start to notice that if every institution is doing very similar things, that we fall into the habit of a, assuming an audience. And so you're not reconstituting audiences, and you're not producing new knowledge. You are actually um, sort of um, uh, replicating, because sometimes that can be an easy thing to do. So this, this weekend, for example, we'll have a workshop with curators who have produced exhibitions in the Modern House that think about different techniques of um, how, how one actually programs a house. Um, huh, that's so interesting. And, and it became also rather fashionable for museums to actually acquire houses, like obviously LACMA did buying the Shoots Gold, or acquiring the Shoots Gold scene. So just quickly, before getting to Shelby, you mentioned that your, that your counterpart in um, Vienna, or your, your, your colleague in, in Vienna, did, you, did I hear you say that she's interested in the Eurocentric? In decentering a oh, Eurocentric. Oh, in decentering yeah. the Eurocentric. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Because I was thinking, <laughs> she's a fan of Eurocentric architecture, and yet you. <laughs> okay, so she's interested in decentering. Well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, how, how might that manifest? In um, I can't speak to her agenda. I mean, I think in general, we're entering. So, we have a history of being bilateral, which is that. Austria, Los Angeles, Austria, Los Angeles. But we, that was a mission, a part of our mission in the 90s. Since then, we have digital spheres of production and engagement. We also have uh, globalization. So I'm very interested in trilateralism. 
you know, what is the relationship we can establish with Mexico? What is the relationship we can establish in the Pacific? We're not working in a bilateral manner in this world as we've seen last year, right? We, we are deeply embedded in a much larger global chain of engagement. So I would be very interested in thinking if there's two poles, Vienna and Los Angeles, what, are the, what happens when you insert a third pole? And what is the dynamic of cultural engagement and, and activity when you start to bring in different? And I have to say, we have always been international, not Austrian, because our artists and architects in residence is an international residency. Anyone can apply. Um, it's not just for Austrians. It's not just for German speakers. We, and if you look at the history of our work, um, it's always been quite cosmopolitan. But we do have um, a wonderful foundation of support through the Austrian Museum of the Museum of Applied Arts. Ah, well, so, so Shelby, of course, you, um, inner city arts, in a way, uh, do you see yourself as a sort of global organization or are you much more, much more concerned with the local? And, um, and tell me about this expansion because you, you said yourself that you were at LAUSD and then there's um, the charter schools and then it, it sounds like you're expanding sort of beyond. We are, LAUSD. we're trying to expand our programming. So I think, I would even, you know, I would be bold and say that we have a, or we're, we are thinking about a global reach, right? We have a program that works. We want to serve our students in our immediate. The pandemic has shown that we can make adjustments, uh, virtual classes, the hybrid model where we're going into schools if schools can't come to our campus. Um, so that's also happening, right? So that expanded that program model. Um, and then I think, we have, because we have a wonderful staff, thinking about different ways that we can partner with organizations that some of our teaching artists work with. Or so we have a, someone on staff that has a relationship with Ghana. So how can we do partnerships with students or teachers out there? And uh, let me be clear that not only do we have our program for our students, right, K through 12, but we also have a professional development for teachers because we want to share our best practices within the education field as well. So not just for arts teachers, but classroom teachers. Um, and then to this, this point, I think, kind of uh, talking about space and how to use space, something that we have on our side, an asset of ours, is this campus. So I'm stepping into a role thinking about how can we use this campus in a way to continue to serve our students, to, to continue to serve the immediate, but let's rethink how we can use this space. Um, I've been in conversation with the city council to think about maybe we become a polling site, right? Uh, during the pandemic, before I was brought on, the, the inner city arts team opened up our theater and it was temporary shelter for some folks. Like we have, that is something that is an asset of ours and I think it's so important that we rethink how we use that space. We have these walls that encompass our beautiful campus, right, on, on 7th and Kohler, but that shouldn't be a barrier to the rest of the world. Huh, that's so interesting, because it has always felt like an oasis, sort of a physical oasis within its environment, but, but has it also not slightly, and, but what you're saying is it's also sort of put, excluding the outside world. It can, I think it can, and I'm not saying that, that this has happened in the past, but just thinking forward, not, you know, trying to, I'm not trying to poop on anyone's past, um, you know, but, but we shouldn't think of those walls of, okay, you can only come into our space, right, and it happens in here. And really, that makes us gatekeepers. So as gatekeepers, who are we opening the doors to? I just want to be very conscious in that effort. Wow. I think, Shelby, also that's something that I think the pandemic has also forced us to think about. You know, our museum was closed for over a year. So we had to find new ways of connecting with our audience, whether that was through digital programming. But it, you know, it also made us think about what does it mean to connect with our community and how do we do that? What does it mean to think about the museum moving beyond its walls? Um, how do we connect with other communities in Los Angeles? Um, you know, this wide dispersed geography that we have. How do we tell our stories and really also sometimes in the places where those stories were created, mm -hmm. rather than expecting that our community always comes to the museum. I think there are other avenues of exploration. I feel like that's something that we share in terms of just thinking differently about what our space can do, but also what we can do in the space beyond. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and it really, sorry, just to go off of that, it really does lend to this partnership model, right? I think as this, this panel of leaders, partnership is part of what we're bringing into this, this work. I don't want to work as a silo. Like, yes, inner city arts can survive on its own. We could just do our thing in our bubble and be fine, but that's not what I think we could do best. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's really changing that model, and, and we don't always have to be the experts. Let's reach out to somebody else and bring them into our space, and we can learn as well. Um, I think that also, that's just a dynamic shift. And how do we share resources? I mean, Gia and I connected long before this panel to think about the ways in which our specific resources, whether that's knowledge, uh, funding, uh, space, how it could be leveraged for us to think about, you know, exciting opportunities. And I think the residency is something that's built into the Schindler House and that is such an incredible resource to Los Angeles. And Gia's thinking so expansively about what that can mean. And I'm really excited about that potential future. Huh. Yeah, it is exciting. And does it also, it has been said, I believe I may even have heard it from one of you, that um, being an executive director, it can be a pretty sort of lonely, it's lonely at the top, you know? It's, it's, it's power, but it's also it's the stresses that come, come with that. Do, are you saying that, um, one, is that true, that it's a lonely job, and two, is this kind of partnering up, actually, does it, does it kind of, in a way, ease, ease, ease that, that weight in some ways? Uh, I would say, uh, Oh, okay, I'll just jump in. <laughs> yeah, sometimes being a, an executive director, a CEO, yeah, it's kind of lonely. Yeah, you can, I just can ask us like how we're doing. It's yeah. really <laughs> helpful. <laughs> it's rare <laughs> that that happens. Um, so I invite that question. Um, but I, th I think even to be more serious is we're, we're here and it's, I think it's also working from a strengths-based approach, right? This is what I have and I want to share it, as opposed to I need to keep all these resources for myself. Mm. I don't know, this is how mm. I come into it. And do them. you think that's a departure from how cultural institutions operated in LA in the past? I would say that it has been a slow shift. So my, by no means am I the impetus for that shift, but yeah, when I came into this work, when I started in a nonprofit 22 years ago, it did feel like, you know, scarcity, and we we got to hold on to what we have. Really? See, that's so fascinating because I've heard over the years from people who say come from New York, they come from, and they say, "Wow, people in LA are so much more open and so much more mutually supportive." And I've heard that for several decades. But you're in your I think that says a lot about New York. <laughs> <laughs> or it says, yes. or it says something about the time that people are in when they're doing the thing, trying to make movements. But has any of you got something that you want to do with your institution that you're butting heads with your board about or your donors or whatever? <laughs> Shelby, I can see you eager to respond. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know who's listening, but so, but I have I have been pretty public about it, and I and I think I'm transparent in it that I do have some issues with the name of our organization in 2021. Inner City Arts. Yes, yeah. Inner City Arts is not a name that sits well with me, um, and I totally I completely acknowledge that. When we were named, when it, it was about location, it, you know, that, that was a word that was used. But I think it's such a loaded word. It's a coded word. And I'm trying to step away from, I guess, in my own, like, you know, soapbox moment. I, I really do want to, like, let's not, let's not use so many codes, right? Whether it's in education, uh, social issues, like, Racism is racism. Systemic racism is racism. You can call it what you want, where you want, but it's basically we all find these different codes to talk about things politely so we don't hurt people's feelings. So um, you're saying that however well-intentioned the founding of Inner City Arts was and the naming of it, that still, nonetheless, its name implies... Or the name, it? yes. I think the name implies both... Uh, it implies people of color and poverty, right? It's, it's a certain status. 
to our point, I don't think it, it also explains the breadth and the, the amazing work that is happening in the organization. So even from that standpoint, I don't, if you said inner city arts and you, you know, are not in the LA art scene, you might not know like what that organization is. And I want to, I want a name that says what we do. I don't know that. You and I don't have, yet? no, I do not have that name in my back oh, pocket. We I'm not you that can slick. send us some options. We've got a little. <laughs> Feel free to. <laughs> By the end of the evening, we'll get the name yeah. changed. Yeah. <laughs> so these are, I mean, yes. Yeah, so that's something that I've, I'm very open with our board of directors and, and they've heard me and, and, and yeah, we're going to go down this road or kind of figure it out. I, that's all I really can say. So it, it's nice that, I mean, I, I told them and, and they didn't fire me. <laughs> no, it's interesting because changing names or building new buildings is often something that new directors do. And as a, someone who stands on the outside watching, sometimes you wonder, why did they go through this name changing process? Their names seem to be fine. Or why did they build this new building? It seemed to be fine. But what you've just outlined is a very interesting unpacking of what might be problematic about that name. It'd be interesting to see where you go with that. Jira, is there anything that you have yet wanted to do that you got a big hard oh. no? So much. Um, <laughs> I really want a new website. Um, but I, you know, probably shouldn't say, I think most of the people who didn't agree with me left. And, and the people left, and what, and what was it they didn't agree with you about? I think the openness of criticism that I was willing to put forward in my leadership I don't want to talk about them. I think that I am not working against a specific body or board or governance structure or even a funding model. I'm working against a perception of Schindler House, modern architecture, Mac Center, and uh, its connotations of preciousness, lifestyle, luxury. You know, we, we have, there's, you know, when you talk about modern architecture in Los Angeles, it comes with all kinds of baggage around um, class, access, property ownership, uh, whiteness. Um, and so the thing I would like to really actively change is that when we use the word architecture, we're not talking about a commodity good that people of wealth can access, but that it's a form of knowledge. It's something that everybody in Los Angeles is accessing on a daily basis, and that we need to broaden the definitions of what architecture is as a process and an idea, and that we all need to engage in that dialogue, and we need to build the institutions to make those dialogues accessible, and we don't. LA has no curatorial department in architecture in any major museum, except the Getty, and it's, a, and it's in the Research Institute. Mac Center is maybe one of three organizations um, working with the mission of advancing public conversations in architecture, um, and we've recently seen the you know, A plus D museum go online. Um, so I have this like deep, deep, deep investment in making sure architecture is still part of a public conversation and it's not just a conversation for property owners. Right, well of course the Schindler House is a, is a, is a great example of the opposite in as much as Schindler was, as you already said earlier, was himself a socialist. I mean, his wife, whom he split up with, and then they had to split up the building so she could live in the other half. Mm -hmm. She used to call him comrade. Yeah. You know, they definitely saw themselves yeah. as on a mission mm -hmm. to bring architecture. Yeah, to and the when masses. Schindler practiced, he was accessible to middle-income, lower-income families, which most architects are not accessible to anymore. Right. So, I think those are big open questions that I, I would love to see people talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, for sure, for sure. Um, Cameron, is there anything that you have wanted to do at CALM that you've been pushed back, again on, pushed back on? No. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm questioned, and I have an opportunity to clarify my perspective and reflect. But no, I haven't met significant pushback. Um, I think there's something though here in your question that is of interest to me, which is this idea that I think to be a leader in these times is to hold a particular type of paradox, which is I am tasked with upholding elements of bureaucracy, like I said, that come with stewarding 
taxpayer dollars. I'm also working towards a future that includes the liberation and healing of black people through my institution, mm -hmm. right? And one could say one of the perpetuators of the systemic violence that has prevented that is the state system, not just the state of California, but the systems of government and the intertwined systems that do that. Mm -hmm. And so I think to do the work that I do is to hold that paradox. And, and I don't know that it looks the same for each of us, but I imagine each of us are trying to hold something like that. You know, wanting to change a system, wanting to destroy a system, and also wanting to uphold it and keep the aspects of it that do work for people, that are human-centered, that do protect people, that do provide stability. So, you know, I think that's something that I navigate in the work every day. So, no, there's not a human that I could say is pushing back on me, but I am navigating the complexities of this. And I think when I talk to other leaders in the arts and cultural space or, or, or across industries, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of people holding that paradox, and I think that's a critical aspect of productive leadership in this time. Hmm. It, is it something you could have public debate about? Is it something you could explore curatorially? Is it something that one can open a discussion about? Or do you, not, or do you think that's not really... All of the above. I mean, I think institutional practice in various phases has been navigating this um, for decades. Mm -hmm. uh, how it manifests at CAM, I think, will continue to to be seen, and there are many things that you know, I'm, I'm thinking about and, and prioritizing to that end, but... Now, it's very interesting you bring this up because your prior position in New Orleans, where you ran Pelican Bomb, um, was, was, was up from the ground. You built that with, with, a, with, with all the people that you collaborated with. It was something you could form yourself. You could establish the hierarchies, the way the, 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 the whole way the organization was structured. Um, that in itself is interesting. What is secondarily extremely interesting is that you then chose to then, I guess, sunset that organization. Um, I'm really interested in when organizations or cultural institutions kind of decide they've, it's time perhaps to just close the doors. You know, perhaps the pressures are too great on funding or whatever, or perhaps it's just sort of been part of a moment in time. And so tell us about your decision and, and making this transition now to this infrastructure, calm with all its state-funded infrastructure. Um, so Pelican Bomb was founded um, post-Katrina in New Orleans. Um, I was not the person who came up with the idea for Pelican Bomb, but I was the person tasked with bringing it to life. And that was a collaborative effort from the very jump. Um, we had a great deal of freedom in that there was nothing else like us. We were started off as an arts criticism publication. And over time, we started to just use listening to artists as our guide to think about what it meant to create an ecosystem in which artists could thrive, um, and what was the infrastructure that was required to make that happen. Um, so that's, you know, I think it's a part of your question. An another part of your question, though, is something that I think Gia and I really share, is coming from the artist-centered, artist-run, nonprofit space, right, which is like a culture in and of its own. I think there is an emphasis on self-determination. There is an emphasis on collaboration. There is an emphasis on alternative structures, alternative models. Um, you know, we practice co active co-decision making, um, consensus building. We were a leaderful organization in the sense that you know we practice emergent strategy. One person might lead and one person might recede uh, based on what we were doing. So these are all dynamics and. That's part of when I say at the beginning there was a set of skills, knowledge, and experiences that I garnered over the years. Pelican Bomb was a key aspect of that. So when I come to the system that I'm in now, I bring an emphasis on collaboration. I bring an emphasis on values-based leadership. You know, these are the things that I'm hoping are transmitted through the work that we do, and that we, I, you know, I can create that environment for our staff that you know really allows us to to take the theory to practice and really like be the organization daily 
that is part of the change that we want to see in the world. And we, I'm going to go throw now to some questions that are coming in from our audience, both in person and online. So, um, uh, uh, watching us on YouTube. So, and I think this relates to what you've just said, actually, uh, Cameron. Um, how much longer do we continue in, to invest in what seems to be a non-functional framework of cultural equity? Can we do something else that centers us? And I think the us is probably people of color, artists of color, um, not a white frame of success. I think this is something you're grappling with. You're, you're all grappling with, actually. Hmm. Who, which of you wants to respond? Yeah, that subject position, because we don't know who that person is, is a hard one to guess at. I, I, so I already told everyone I have no answers. I just have questions. I have, questions. I have a ton of questions. So I don't know um, how to provide an alternative. I have two thoughts. One is um, the organization I was previously at, Materials and Applications, before I joined Mac Center this year, uh, we were really interested in the question of how one can um, incorporate principles of mutual aid into a nonprofit organization. Hmm. So some of the work that we did all of last year were a series of working groups in which we were rethinking how um, you can guide an organization through its structures following three principles of mutual aid practice, which is first to identify harmful systems, second to redistribute resources, Oh my God, I'm forgetting the third one. Um, uh, I'm so sorry, I will come up with it again. Why, it's like been our mantra for a while and um, this is what happens when you go into another institution, you forget. You, yeah, so that's been, um, following that model has been a really helpful way for us to rethink what it means to be ourselves institutional subjects because when you work in an institution as I am myself and as anyone we are all institutional subjects. We've all moved through different institutions. We've gone to school, we've gone to university. Some of us have gone to university. Some of us has wor have worked in uh, restaurant businesses. And th these are all things that condition us. So when we go out in the world, we have these frameworks. Kind of, I also, also, yeah. So I, I think that is one way I would think about how you can model, oh, model alternatives. That's the third one. How you can model alternatives. <laughs> Um, uh, and um, yeah, I, I'll just stop there. Yeah. But I also uh, say institutions are made up of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The people are what determine the values of the institution. Mm -hmm. So it's not about changing institutions. It's about thinking about the people that we empower within our institutions to be decision makers, to be contributors, and to feel like they are valued members of determining the institution's future. Okay, which is a perfect segue into a question that just came in, which is the people beyond, outside the doors of the institution, as in the communities around it, do you think it's possible to include communities in a more participatory form of cur curation and programming? Do you want to speak to that, Shelby? Yeah, I certainly think so. Um, opening up the space, uh, I mean, for example, at Inner City Arts, having the space for community members to think about the programming that they want, I think that's very important. Right, you have to have that, um, an, I don't know what others just say, like an open door policy and getting real feedback on what it is that we want. I mean, we grapple with that with, for example, the Rosenthal Theater is on our campus, right? It's not, it was never intended to be like an out, like, you know, a black box theater that was just gonna create revenue, but it was really to serve our students and to serve the community. So. We have to do the work in asking what, how does the community want to use that space? What is it for? It's not just for us to say, here it is, come to the show, that's, you know, and but, thank you, goodbye. And who is your community, though? Is it the physical community immediately uh, surrounding inner city arts, or is it the, your, 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 your students who are coming from quite a, a wide radius? I think it's both. I think it's both, because we are, our community of students is expanding past the, the typical nine mile radius of what we originally you know, programmed for. So our community has expanded geographically. Hmm. Um, so someone with, 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 with a pretty practical question about the hiring process. Um, what was your hiring process like, Shelby and Cameron, the questioner wants to know. Um, 
Did you seek out your ideal cultural institutions or did they come looking for you? Uh, so the consulting firm actually came looking oh. for me, which, you know, that's nice that people knew that I existed as a person. <laughs> <laughs> it's always flattering. Um, yes, yeah, so, so I was approached, you know, and asked if I would be interested in this position. And I have to say it's the first time that I was going into the interview process that I felt like I had just as much ownership in interviewing the board of directors, interviewing the staff that met with me, because I had, you know, just a power dynamic. I had a job I had with an organization that I, I loved. Um, so it was really heartbreaking to leave something at that Artworks. I loved. At Artworks LA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to leave Artworks LA to go into inner city arts, but one, just personally, to have that challenge. I was like, I don't know, I, I, I am a sucker for, for challenges, you know? If it makes me feel nervous and kind of nauseous, I'm probably gonna do it. Um, wow, that's because you go on stage. Yeah, You're there you go, it. you know? Look at my arms, you know, clearly. I like pain. <laughs> um, so there's, there's that. Um, so that was just like my personal, like, I wanna try this, I, I, I'm up for the challenge. And the, the board and the staff was very honest with me, like, Hey, this is you know this is not a perfect place, so this is what we're looking for. Um, so to, to answer that question, I just feel like it, it was it was the first time in my professional career that I was walking into something where I had choice in it, just going into that, and that's that's a very unique place, and I, I recognize that 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 worked in my favor. Well, congratulations, Cameron. Um... So I joined CAM as the deputy director and chief curator in September of 2019. So worked in that role until February of this year when I became the executive director. So to speak to how I first joined CAM, I applied. Mm -hmm. um, I had been watching the work that the institution had been doing um, and my predecessor in that role of deputy director and chief curator Naima Keith had a very public moving on when she moved on she to, moved LACMA. to LACMA. So I saw it in the newspaper. And I thought, well, here's an opening. And wouldn't you know, I think I'm the perfect person for it. <laughs> for you. Did, so was there an application form or did you just sort of? Yeah, I went through off the website and applied using the state form that was provided for me and went through the CalHR hiring process. Wow, is that a kind of convoluted, complicated process? It can be. <laughs> well, congratulations. Um, so, um, so the pandemic, we haven't talked much about it yet, but you've, you three have all referenced it. And um, certainly some, one of our um, audience members wants to know more about that. Um, how about your communities? How engaged are they? Are they still hesitant to come out? Hungry for the content? Somewhere in between? Are your audiences up or down relative to a couple of years ago? Gia. Um, so we, we were able to open before most institutions were able to open because the Schindler House is an open air architecture. Um, the, it, it was designed to um, enact a lifestyle as if you were on a campsite. You should come visit, I, it's hard to explain. Um, but. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, you know, we can't uh, keep people out of the house, um, and our numbers have been pretty consistent. So we've been very lucky, you know. I think that because we're small, we're a small institution, we're open air, uh, and when you come, it's a very intimate experience of architecture. We've been able to um, really uh, see similar, if not higher, visitation numbers. Um, and what I'm trying to really think about is how architecture is very physical, durational. Um, it, it benefits from being on site. On the other hand, conversations about architecture and, of course, art, um, that can happen anywhere. So I'm really trying to find a way in which we also maybe like him and like inner city arts. I can't say that without feeling like you're <laughs> unhappy with the... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. Can Shelby's it. organization. Um, I see it. Uh, I see. Um, so I, we, uh, we're really trying to expand um, the different sites of engagement. I think institutions everywhere are thinking about how um, social media 
um, mailing lists, digital platforms are becoming independent spaces of production alongside the physical side of the institution. Um, and that's where I would like to really improve our capacities as an institution because we are a global institution. We have an international artists and architects residency with um, you know, dozens and dozens of um, artists from dozens of countries around the world. And so we have this unique situation where we can, we do have a global audience and we need to be in contact. And also I think people access institutions, um, you know, they, it's not always about the exhibition, you know. It's not always about the exhibition it, right. or the site. It's, there's different ways of engaging. Oh, and to that point, I would say the Schindler House is a kind of perfect destination during the pandemic because it's a garden as well as a house. It's a meditative yeah. space. Um, what about you, you two in the pandemic? So our audience has changed in how we're accessing our students, right? So we aren't fully on campus. Our campus is now open and we're having some in-person classes, uh, but quickly in you know March of 2020, we shifted to a virtual online platform to provide our arts programming. And this past summer, we did some residencies on school campuses to try that out. And I think moving forward, it's gonna become a hybrid of all of those, where you will bring schools back to our campus um, when it's safe to do so, because getting kids on buses, you know, that's still, still kind of a safety issue. Um, we will go into schools as well, to have a residency model, and then I think with some of our after-school programmings, always having a virtual component to the in-person. So just sh shifting is really the theme. Because yours is a school. In that sense, yours yeah. is a very different institution. The kids yeah, it's want not to an be open. Yeah, it's, yeah, we're, pre yeah. we're presenting. Yeah. We are presenting institutions. and Yeah, and we're more of an, a school. Yeah. Right, right. Cameron. I would just say I think sites of engagement is such a beautiful term. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's a lot of the work that we're doing as well, recognizing the ways in which virtual CAM, you know, the programs that we put online through Zoom, YouTube, um, that we reached a whole new audience through them and how do we maintain and continue to connect with that audience, but then also how do we, you know, help people understand the museum is available to them and to try to make that experience as safe and comfortable for people as possible. You know, there's some real sad moments in the sense that you know, CAM had become known for these incredible 3,000 person dance parties where people were like line dancing the night away. And we haven't been able to do that during the pandemic. And I don't know when we will be able to do that again um, safely in terms of our administrative lift. Um, so, you know, my hope is in 2022, y'all can come dance at CAM again. But, you know, until then, we try to make do with the circumstances that we're in now and really think about the sites of engagement piece. And, you know, my background is in digital publishing. Um, it's in writing. So thinking about the ways in which we tell our stories through our website, um, the ways in which social can become a different type of engagement forum. You know, these are the things that we're thinking through now, but they also take capacity, right? Mm -hmm. It's one thing when your museum, you have your museum centered around people coming to the museum. Then a pandemic says nobody can come to the museum. So then you put all your resources into going out. Then you're in a hybrid model and you've still got people that got to run the live stream and got to do this and that and the other. And, you know, and it's a challenge. And so thinking about how we use the resources that are available to us and also build the capacity in the future to now that we have a different vantage point from what to see the museum and our audience engagement. So as relatively new leaders in all of your institutions, you came in knowing you had a somewhat complex project ahead of you and then it was made that much more um, challenging, but probably in ways that, that were also brought about innovation. It's been a whirlwind for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. You know, I changed jobs. I managed the pandemic <laughs> or tried. You know, it's been a whirlwind, but you know, it's been a time of learning and reflection and I'm grateful for all the people that I've connected with and reconnected with. So Shelby and I have known each other since I was born. Our fathers were friends in high school and are still fathers and are still friends to this day and they're also and still, they're fathers still fathers. fathers. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it has provided this new context and space of engaging with some really incredible thinkers and 
change makers and people who are being beautiful in the world, and I'm very grateful for, for that. And we, we have to conclude, we're running out of time, but um, this panel really has been about this theme of sort of breaking with the past, the new cultural leaders, new faces, new identities. Having said that, is there anything, is there anything great that any of you could say about past leaders in LA that now you look at through kind of new eyes, now you're in their shoes? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just say, I, when I stepped into this position, it was not a position I would have anticipated pursuing. Um, and I was reflecting a lot about how I got here and who I was in gratitude towards. And I would say, um, I'll just name them. I don't know if they're in the audience. There were two educators in my life who, in high school, I interned at MOCA as a high school intern, uh, Denise Gray and Catherine Arias, who I think is still at MOCA as a director of visitor engagement and education. Um, and we were talking about this earlier, you know, like I feel an immense gratitude to leadership that's not, um, uh, leadership that might be more invisible than we would like them to be. And these were the people who offered and built opportunities for my growth and my development and we were discussing another time is what is it, you know, in my position, in our position now, we, rather than think only about the change we will make immediately, I think a lot about what a next generation needs and how we can produce the structures of support and thresholds of entry to allow the next generation of leadership to enter into the cultural sphere. And again, I don't have answers, but that's something I actively try to hone in on when there's time to think about that. Um, yeah, that would be my answer. It, it would be educators in my life who have been a huge part of my world, yeah. Uh, for me, I think past bosses and other leaders that I really admire, the biggest takeaway is that they surround themselves with really smart people that don't think like them. Um, and. I think that's like the best way to move forward is I, I want to surround myself with the smartest folks in the room because it's not always me. Um, and you don't have to agree with me either. It's probably best that you don't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, and, and I've learned that, you know, Cynthia Campoy Brophy was the founder of Artworks LA and she was my boss for 10 years. Um, you know, before I took her over that position. And that's something that I, I just watched her do, right? She, she knew how to put people in the room. And I even see that with our, the founder of, of Inner City Arts, uh, Bob Bates. Like, he is so passionate about, he just wants a space for young people to be creative. And he surrounds himself with, with people that are gonna help make that come to fruition. Cameron, you close us out. Oh, my answer is so much less beautiful than those answers. I, I gained a real respect for management um, of how complex it is to work with people, to cultivate people, to hold people accountable, to help them be their best selves. That's really, really hard work. And I have a different level of respect now that I'm in that work um, for it than I ever had before. Well, thank you. I knew you would close us out eloquently. Cameron Shaw, Executive Director with California African American Museum. Shelby Williams Gonzalez, President and CEO of ICA. And um, <laughs> Jia Igu, Director of the Max Center for Art and Architecture. It's really a pleasure to talk to you. The conversation could carry on, but we have a lovely reception waiting for us in the room to our left at the end, and you can see a wonderful show of textile arts. Um, thank you, Moira and Sarah and Zocalo and uh, the, all the team at Helms. Um, it's, it's so interesting. I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation. Somebody had put in a question about me and my own experience with KCRW. I didn't really feel it was like, the, the, this was the forum for that, but I'm happy to talk to whoever the person was that asked that question when we gather in, uh, outside in the reception. So, um, so with that, uh, thank you very much.